uh, we've got Boeing down a quarter of a percent. Caterpillar, though, however, notably is up here. Apple taking it on the chin, taking the Dow with it. 6.88% when I last look at it. Let's turn that over. Look at Apple. Not a good chart there. So we're seeing stocks in the red here. A tough afternoon of selling. Don't like to see this on a Friday, but we're keeping an eye on it for you. Neil? All right, uh, Jerry, thank you very, very much. Uh, to politics right now, the president's continuing campaign blends, this time in West Virginia, Indiana, to Senate seats that he wants to flip. Jeff Block is live in Indianapolis right now. Hey, Jeff. Neil, hello to you from uh, preparations for the Trump rally. There you go, right behind me in this uh, Southport High School gymnasium. About 7,000 people here. And I got a tweet from the president for you. Two rallies today. We're going to West Virginia and Indiana, says the president. Don't tell anyone. Big secret. We'll keep it to ourselves. But I will be bringing Coach Bobby Knight to Indiana. He has been a supporter right from the beginning of the greatest political movement in American history. I think I just felt George Washington turn over his grave there, but that's fine. He's here to support Mike Braun. That is the Republican businessman who is running for the Senate here in Indiana, running against Joe Donnelly, the Democratic senator. Uh, Mr. Braun got help yesterday from the senator from South Carolina, Lindsey Graham, who came in to say, I like Joe Donnelly, he's a colleague of mine, but when it comes down to the big issues like Justice Kavanaugh and tax reform, he has voted with a radical left. Listen to Lindsey Graham. When you get to that fork in the road, It'll be an easy decision for Mike Braun. I've never campaigned against colleagues in a meaningful way before until now. Uh, Joe Donnelly, by the way, is uh, rated uh, by one organization as the most bipartisan Democrat in the Senate. And he has embraced President Trump in a lot of ways, Neil. Uh, you know, he said that he would work even with the president on the wall. Uh, he says he has done a lot to, uh, you know, essentially bring the two parties together. At the same time, he acknowledges this is a red state and it's going to be tight. Listen to both candidates now. It's a very close race, and we know it's very close. But I feel really confident in the efforts that we've put in on the ground, on the doors we've knocked on. We called on over 100,000 doors just this weekend alone. There was some sluggishness, I think, on our side until we went through the Kavanaugh proceedings, and that galvanized, I know, Hoosiers, and I think people across the country. I don't know how much it's galvanized them here, if you believe the polls. You know, they've been back and forth uh, over the course of this race, but the latest Fox News poll has drawn down to Donnelly by seven points, well, without uh, outside the margin of error. So uh, they need the president here, and not only will he, here, he will be here today, Neil, but he'll be coming back on Monday to Fort Wayne for another rally here in Indiana. They clearly want to work this state. Neil. You know, Jeff, it's hard to hear me, I understand, but, uh, you know, he is, Donnelly is been really pounding the health care issue. And it, uh, I'm wondering if that is what has opened up his lead, albeit in, just in these recent polls, but what do you make of that? Well, you know, I asked about last night whether the president's, uh, you know, threat of executive order on immigration, which, of course, is the Republicans' big talking point, whether that has hurt. Uh, he didn't want to say it had hurt, but I, I think, uh, you know, those moderate voters that are so important here in Indiana in a, uh, in a toss-up state, it, that doesn't help when you talk about that. Health care is a much more resonant issue for these, uh, these voters here. Jeff, thank you very, very much. Jeff Block uh, in Indianapolis here. Uh, let's get the read on the list of the fallout from all of this with uh, the Daily Caller News Foundation's Chris Bedford, Nathan Rubin joining us as well, the Democratic commentator and Cabot Phillips of Campus Reform. Cabot ended with you in this notion that maybe the health care issue, those candidates who have been pounding it, even Republicans who are trying to address it and saying we're going to fix it, it has risen to the point of being a mover. Um, yeah. What's going on here? What, what do you think? Yeah, it's now appearing in, a, in the past month, about 52% of Democrat ads have mentioned health care as one of the main issues. I think it, it's certainly one of the main things. I don't know what kind of impact it's going to have in a state like Indiana. I, I still think that the main message, though, coming out of the National Democrat Party has not been one of a policy. It's been more of a the, the idea of we're going to push back against everything Trump is doing. We're going to be the party of resistance, which may play well in the times where the economy is struggling, where things aren't booming the way they are. But with each positive job support that comes out, I think that message is not resonating as much uh, with average voters. So I think that's something to look at as well. Chris, what about the president making uh, quite a bit of fuss over this approaching caravan? It won't arrive here until sometime in December, just if you 
you, you just follow the, the, the miles these people are walking to get here and all, but that he has made that a very, very big issue. Um, and and all, oftentimes at the expense of the economy, which is a very winning story for him. What do you think? I think it's the ideal issue of the caravan because he has not had a fight to motivate the base. And any kind of midterm election is going to be a base election. And there's this silly conventional wisdom, which is basically Spanish for lazy, that goes around Washington, D.C., that a fight in the Senate or a fight in the House over immigration would be played badly for Republicans. Obviously, guys like Eric Cantor and everyone who lost the primary to President Trump know that that's actually not the case and that immigration plays well to the base. And unfortunately, even though the economy should be one of the main issues, it really often is when it's doing poorly, because voters don't opt to come out and thank you for the things you did. They hold you accountable for the things you didn't. Um, if that is true, then, then there, there might be a strategy that could help the president longer term here. But I think lost in this argument and where you can get independent voters is to remind them that legal immigration has soared under his presidency. Whatever you make of the caravans and the fuss here, because the, the general consensus reading editorials in the Washington Post today and the New York Times yesterday and all, is that... Uh, He's anti-immigrant, period, when the numbers belie quite the opposite. What do you think? Well, when his rhetoric is touching on the migrant caravan day in and day out, and we're starting to see some of his supporters resort to violent tactics, and they are yielding also anti-immigrant and anti-Semitic uh, views that they say are being kind of resonated from the top, I, I think we have to take a step back and say, why don't we tone down the rhetoric on, on the immigration and talk about real issues that matter to the American people, like health care. There's a reason that Democratic candidates are pushing this issue, because they see health care costs are skyrocketing, but toning and they down know the that rhetoric matters work to the people. Both ways, right, Nathan, including those who have said the president's a racist or a Nazi. I mean, it works both ways, right? It, it, it certainly goes both ways, but they are. it is asymmetrical in this instance with Donald Trump calling the migrant caravan, who's over a thousand miles away, an invasion, talking about how they're going to throw rocks and send troops down to the border, when in reality, these folks are walking around in flip-flops on empty stomachs, and anyone who can throw a rock a thousand miles from the south of Mexico to the border shouldn't be shot. They should be signed to an MLB contract. Well, there is that. But, Cabot, I think what the president is trying to say is that they're not all to be uh, trusted or the seen as asylum seekers. The bottom line is we just don't know who is in that. We do know that good many do seek asylum. We do know there is a process for that. We do know the but, numbers uh, are dwindling drastically. Right, that caravan is point. an that easy That is a fair enough thing. point. But, Cabot, what I want to ask you, yeah. when you talk to young people, the issue is that this is the election young people are going to turn out. Um, but that has been sort of like a... a a promise that's gone empty in one election after another. Um, what is your sense of how many yeah. young people show up for this election? I don't think there are going to be record-breaking numbers. And two things, when I talk to young people, like I said, I've been on over 100 college campuses with Campus Forum in the last year or so, and there, there's two things I've noticed. Number one, a lot of young people, they don't really see the results and the rhetoric aligning. They've been told by the Democrat Party, by the media, that the world was going to end under Trump, that every new thing he does was going to kill millions of people, and that hasn't happened. So I think they don't really trust the Democrats or the media completely. And also, I don't think you could ignore the 2016 elections. A lot of young Democrats who supported Bernie Sanders they feel disenfranchised by the party. They feel like it was robbed and it was rigged towards Hillary Clinton away from Bernie. I think that's going to cause a lot of them to view the Democrat Party uh, maybe not as loyally as before. I'm not saying all those people are going to show up for Republicans, but I don't know if it'll be as much of a blue wave as maybe more of a blue trickle from young people. Um, Chris Bedford, what's your latest view of the House and how that's going to go? The people of the Republican Party aren't incredibly hopeful of the House, but I would say that there's still definitely a chance. Right now, it looks like they're going to maybe pick up about four seats, but it looks like they'll lose something in the 30s, which is going to flip the House and cause a lot of trouble for anyone who's in Trump's cabinet and for the White House, a lot of headaches. But there's still absolutely a chance, and I think the pollsters have been proven over and over again to be missing really key factors in, this, in, in any of these races over the past year. So I'd All say right. if you're a Democrat or Republican, you should have some champagne in the fridge and a bottle of whiskey in the cabinet, because the night could go either way. <laughs> Just so we might do that with our coverage here. Guys, thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, just to put it in perspective, in 1982, when uh, Ronald Reagan uh, saw 27 seats go, he was expected to lose eight seats that year. Again, as I said, he, he lost uh, an additional 27 more. Uh, and the markets were supposed to tank. The next day, they were up about 4%, up 18% six months later after that, and 20% a year after that. 2006, uh, George Bush uh, had to work with the Democratic House and the Senate 
Uh, stocks were thought to tank after that. They were up 9% six months later, up 7% one year later. And uh, going into this weekend in 1980, when Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter were going to battle it out, uh, they were statistically even. A few days later, it was a Reagan landslide. Something about consensus. Be very careful. More to this.